Welcome to another episode of We Are Carbon. I'm Helen Fisher and I'm joined by Dan Horta, co-founder of GaiaNet, for a discussion that moves the focus out of the soil and our natural environments and puts it instead on our societal ecosystems. What role does our relationship with ourselves and with one another have within moving towards a more regenerative planet? It seems likely that it's a huge factor. You don't go far within regenerative discussions without coming across themes of collaboration, community, a desire for a greater sense of transparency and an economic structure that's altogether more equitable. And those kind of changes can require us to look really deep. Dan's work is driven by a vision of a more beautiful society that's not only regenerative of the land, but of the human spirit and connection too. GaiaNet is a network designed to bring together like-minded organisations to unify and amplify each of their efforts in building this more harmonious society. We touch on the variety of transformational work that is happening at this time, from new approaches to the internet and finances, to the work that GaiaNet is doing itself to support organisations in changing their hierarchy for greater productivity and success. Before we get into it, I'd like to make my own request for collaboration. I'm reaching out to organisations and individuals to partner up with We Are Carbon for sharing messages far and wide about the power in our food choices. I'm reaching out at a very early stage while I'm developing the ideas here, and it would be a huge help if you could take a few minutes to learn a little more and maybe fill out a survey if it sounds relevant to you. Look out for a link in this episode's description. And now let's get stuck in. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. A real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, would you be able to kick things off by just giving a brief introduction to yourself? Sure thing. So uh, my name is Dan, Dan Horter. Um, I was born, well, this body was born in Holland. And sometimes people ask, where are you from? And I actually don't know where I'm from. It's kind of a joke, but not really. Um, because... Um, yeah, I felt out of sorts a lot of times in my life, not being able to connect with the world, society, the environment. And the older I get, the more sense that makes why I was feeling a little lost and confused. And I think all of my life I've been searching, searching for other people that see a different future and um, not being able to really understand and comprehend why the things are the way they are. Like, I think a lot of people are maybe thinking, like, what are you talking about? Because the world's great, you know, and the world is great. Um, I've had many wonderful experiences, many travels in my life. I've been able to educate myself. I went through uh, different schools. I learned to work with my hands as a car mechanic. I learned to use the mind as a, an aircraft engineer, studying aerospace engineering. And also I worked for a while as an engineer. And... Um, yeah, I, at some point I, I went into personal development and personal growth, and that was around the age of 27. I'm 39 now. And that really kickstarted a huge transformation that actually never stopped. And uh, in that journey, I, I think I came to some realizations that uh, I do have some kind of purpose, and it became a quest of what is that then? And through the work with, uh, oh gosh, geez, I've done like hundreds of therapies, healing modalities, uh, workshops, uh, and tried a lot of different things that I would say allowed us human beings to come more in tune with who we are and also help us to see a bigger picture. And many call that raising your consciousness. And I recently read this definition of like, if you have an elevated consciousness or highest, a higher consciousness means that you are better able to interpret the patterns of which you are in and also being able to influence these patterns and these systems in in society that you're in so um yeah i, I tried out a lot of things with how can i uh, serve humanity and how can we transition because in all of this journey I, I i ran into a lot of amazing people amazing stories but also prophecies of indigenous people and um also looking at like how does politics work? How does money work? How does power work on the planet? And how do we actually fulfill our needs as a humanity? And that's been really alive for me. And how can we allow uh, humanity to reach higher states of evolution 
and become better at fulfilling our needs. I think that is really why we are together as a society. We are together to help each other out and to help each other thrive and do that in a harmonious way with our environment. Because if we don't, we're going to self-terminate. And I think that's one of the realizations over the last decade that it looks like humanity is not heading for a very healthy course. And I think many people are seeing that by the destruction of our ecosystem, of uh, uh, the amount of mental health problems in our societies, uh, the, the power plays in politics. You know, there's a lot of things that could be better. And it's important to honor all the work that's happened so far of all of humanity up until today. We have evolved tremendously from being pretty much poor all over the planet to, you know, there's more wealth now than ever. But the wealth is unequally distributed and a lot of people are suffering. And, and throughout my journey, as I become more aware of the patterns around me, I also became more, you know, well, I feel more of, of the, the, the pain and the suffering. So I guess I've become more compassionate and empathic also towards the greater whole and not just about my own life. Well, long story short, all of this has led to... Um, finding another group of amazing people finally in my life after searching for a long time that also have a dream that we can actually create a beautiful future for all life on earth. And that was the birth of Guy in it. Um, and through that process and also the last 10 years, I realized the only really way to create something new that is really going to make a big change is by building infrastructure, cities and villages that operate completely different from a whole systems perspective that really focus on the needs of the people that live there and also restoring the nature, the ecology around it and becoming regenerative really for the people and for the planet and for humanity at large. So at this moment, all of my life revolves around that and I spend full time on Guyanet, on supporting physical projects, villages under development and I'm here in Brazil also to build a prototype for a city for a new humanity. So that's sort of a story. That's absolutely wonderful. It, it really does resonate with me in terms of you started out saying that, well, people will think, you know, what am I talking about? Because the world's absolutely fine. But uh, no, I, I agree. I feel very driven um, in similar ways uh, that, that there's, you know, you go through your life thinking that, that this isn't how things should be but that there's not really any connection there or any understanding from the people or, or, you know, there's no one searching for that change and what the internet has offered us and what, what this kind of, I suppose it feels like there's more and more ability to connect online today that, that then you can find that actually you're not on, you're not alone with your thinking and by no means, um, a, a, is it a case of one, one battling person against the whole challenge of, of changing these these issues in the world. There's so many individuals working towards um, positive, regenerative um, change. And as you've you've introduced us there to Guyanet, which is a project that you are two and a half years into, is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. So so you've been working on this um, for for a little chunk of time, and the. Could you could you explain a little bit more? You've said that the idea behind it is obviously this 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 vision that we we can connect more healthy and more positively as a society and with one another. Could you just explain what what Guyanet is in in sort of in in a sort of simplistic way? Sure. Um to define what what it is i guess we are a network of networks and um a very particular kind of network because we are looking for people who are working on a new earth on a new paradigm we call that a new earth but you can give it whatever name you want you can also uh, define it as um, the transition of humanity to go from capitalism individualism extractivism towards um becoming more symbiotic with nature and each other. And we call that a regenerative network. And um, we've been collecting a lot of people. So building, building out that network and uh, trying to find projects, also projects, project leaders and people that are heading in a vision towards a vision of a, yeah, a transformed world. It's, uh, it's, it's, and 
we started off with a dream and the last two and a half years have been magical because the dream has not become some ideal or some utopia, but we see people building big pieces of this puzzle that once clicked together are potentially going to completely shift humanity to a different way of operating. And so we're mainly a network of networks and in that we have been practicing our own transformation together at a very small scale of how can we practice radical honesty, professionalism, get things done and distribute power. Actually, like the main thing about that, and I think the main thing that humanity needs to do is, is power shift our culture. And that's a very deep rabbit hole to go into. I'm not going to go too deep, but so internally we've been practicing that. So what we are also is a, we call that then a heart driven organization where we really learn to feel in the moment, not make big plans of the future, but we call that sense and respond. And we've been practicing that through holacracy. And in that journey, besides building the network, mapping the partners, mapping the people, mapping the projects, we are working on a so-called ecosystem mapping project. Besides that, we are now also developing uh, support services for other groups and organizations to learn to distribute power and authority and uh, yeah, reach a next level of professionalism. So at this moment, we're also offering these consulting services. But what GuyNet really is and what it aims to be and what we are working towards is to be a mycelium, to be, if you can call it like a, not a central hub, but a web, a web of solutions, people and resources in order to really power shift humanity to the next stage in our evolution. So, yeah. Yeah, very wonderful. It's something that um, it comes to mind, this journey of, I suppose, as you've described it, and a higher consciousness or in, in sort of evolving the human consciousness to be more heart centered. And, and these are all terms that in many ways, um, it leads to a spiritual journey, it leads to um, a, a, a place of, as you've described, new earth. And this is a theme that is, um, it can be, in some regards, a little triggering in, in the sense of um, we've, we've gone through history as, as humanity in a very divisive manner. And, and there comes to mind different belief systems and religions. And, and so much of the conflict between humanity is on separation between belief. And I think what you're talking about here is absolutely beautiful, the idea of symbiosis between society itself, because we have, on this show, we we talk about all manner of ideas and diverse topics that come together to this theme of regeneration. And a lot of that can be science-based, it can be very ecosystem-based, very physical, very grounded. And yet it misses this aspect of how do we come together as individuals, as society, as groups of people to collaborate for one purpose and one vision when we aren't really used to having that connectivity between us. So it's a huge piece of the puzzle. And I think that I suppose what I would like to ask is, do you consider it to be for anybody does it hold a, a specific belief system or do like you've said you've transitioned through different focuses in your life from being hands-on as an engineer to now working with groups of different people do you think that anyone can find their way within this um as you described new earth or is it does it have a sense of um particular um belief behind it I like to say and like to think that it's without dogma and without doctrine, because that feels very old. If it is for everybody, it's a big question and it, it's a long answer. So I'll do my best to condense it. I wish to believe that it is for everybody. However, what I've found in the last 10, 15 years that, that there is a, 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 a subset of the population that's really interested in growth and developing themselves and going inside and looking at themselves deeply. And then what they find, learn to work with that and transform that. And some people call that like healing your past or traumas or whatever. But for me, it's like the willingness to evolve your consciousness. And there's a lot of beautiful people on this planet. And 
there is quite a large group of people that are not there yet maybe i hope that over the next hundreds of years all of humanity will transition to have a collective mindset unfortunately though the programming the propaganda the hundreds of years that have gone before us this is in our dna it it really led us to be super separate from each other and a lot of people are very disconnected from even just their feelings let alone from nature, let alone from spirit. That is an even bigger disconnect. So we like to think that we want to create something that is open for anybody to access. However, if people choose to go in that direction, they are going to have to go on a journey and qualify and show that they're willing and and you know accept the the, the required letting go of comforts of of, of things that they're used to and to yeah you would. the only way to create a new paradigm is if we completely evolve from the inside out and if people are not willing to evolve from the inside out then yeah there is no way that you can bring them together in a harmonious environment so i don't know does that answer your question it does yeah i think that it's um it's such a significant aspect um personal journey and i think that this applies to everything that we choose to experience in life the world is full of diverse opportunities things that we can either give our attention to or not and I suppose what Guyanet is offering is is a, a piece of the pie that people know if that suits them because that feels comfortable and that feels like it's offering them the steps that they're searching for because they have looked within and they are looking to um to to maybe step out of that comfort or do things in a different way so i suppose it's it's a case of it will attract the people whom are on are on that place and that doesn't necessarily come with any dogma i suppose that's what you're saying is if people are choosing that that's for them there's there's no there's no dictated uh, ideas no. that they have to. Yeah, and it's really interesting, the people that we meet at first glance, some like we invite people when we feel this resonance at the heart and we feel a really good connection. And, you know, you, you're feeling comfortable with somebody and you feel like you get each other. That That's a good first step, you know, to start doing things together. And some of those people, we, ha we have a journey for people to onboard into Guyanet. And a part of that is our homecoming journey where we offer you know, a little bit about Guyanet and there's a little meditation journey and a visualization. And then, you know, they're really welcomed into the collective, into the community. And a lot of people there are there with tears in their eyes. They're like, wow, I found my tribe. I found home. This is music to me. And then we have the other extreme of people that read the website and talk with us. And there's this initial connection. But when they go deeper, they're like, no, this is too weird or it's like too spiritual or and they just like they don't even enter into it so that way it self selects but i don't think we do that through i don't know stating a certain belief system or something it's just how we write and how we talk and how we show images and materials and i think it's really beautiful because the people that really do go deep inside we have only 500 members in the network but out of that i think 300 of these people are highly aligned and highly in resonance with the vision of a new earth and that's a lot because I was looking for 15 years and I didn't find one. And the last two and a half years, we found 300. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's very promising. And I think something that comes to mind, this is something that I've experienced in my work in perhaps a different way, but that it's connected, is this idea that when we talk holistically and we're trying to create content or um, at some kind of organized um we're inviting somebody to, to take an interest in our work from a holistic point of view. And that can be very broad. And um, do you find that you have to find focus within that? Or can you just keep the picture really, really big? And, and it still works from, from, I suppose, what I'm thinking is more from a business point of view, if there's this, yeah. Um, yeah. the need to find a niche. Yeah, that's a very good point and a good topic. And uh, I, I'd say we've been a bit naive in the beginning, thinking that everybody wants this big vision to happen and everybody wants humanity to completely change and transform and start fulfilling the needs of humanity instead of the needs of a small group of people. But uh, 
It's not enough to just stay broad and talk about a beautiful vision. That's very clear because we've tried all kinds of routes to get funding in. And we've talked with some foundations that really are in line and in resonance with creating a more beautiful world, but we were too vague for them. And we've also found this with people coming in, getting lost and confused and not understanding what Guyanet's about. So yes, it needs to be very specific. And it's hard. And I don't think it will work if you stay too broad and speak too widely. You do need an audience. You do need some kind of proposition. You do need to provide concrete value that people can simply in one glance see why you exist and what it is that you do in the world to make the world better. If you just talk about a more beautiful world, that alone is not enough. Yeah. And do you continually hone this idea as you're going? So year after year, you anticipate that you're yeah, developing that? Well, it's also a long story of, of everything we've gone through because we've really had a lot of experiences trying to get money into the organization. And a year ago, we really made the decision, okay, we need to stop trying to bring everybody together and connect everybody and work on the needs of the members of our network. And we need to start focusing on the needs of GuyNet and that's make money. That's to bring in cash, you know? So that's when we started to develop self-support, um, co-creation support services. So that's when we start to get much better at self-organizing, develop also material and, you know, offer this to the world that we can support organizations. And even though this is not our final purpose, you know, we envision to be a hub, a network where resources flow, where people connect and there's a lot of technology involved and stuff, but we're not there yet. And for now, it works to help organizations to get better at distributing authority and get more effective and efficient at their work and people pay for that. So, yeah. Yeah. So you're identifying a specific service that you can offer and you are, can articulate because of uh, honing in on that a little bit. That's fantastic. Yeah. And it, it is born out of what we are doing because we are, we are in contact with so many projects and we've held many meetings and we listen very deeply to what are the challenges that people are having. And yeah, the big problem there is, is in, in the regenerative movement at large, Apart from there, of course, there are some corpor corporations that are very professional, but overall it's quite a new movement the last five years. And what's really lacking is facilitation. And what really jumps out is that people do not want to work in a traditional hierarchy. They do not want to work because it's not regenerative, right? If somebody gives you orders and has the power to hire and fire you, there is naturally, implicitly, there is this imbalance of you're not on, on equal ground. So in order to become regenerative as a collective, we need to sit, learn to sit in circle again, like we did tens of thousands of years ago. And that can be done by facilitating non-rivalrous processes. And we've really been deeply embodying that and now we're ready to give that to the world. And yeah, that's very needed, like facilitation and, and support of how to create together, how to make decisions together, how to plan your projects and then how to trust that everybody does their work without a boss. That's quite something. And that's really missing. Yeah. So we're feeling also a, a market need, you know, a business need that we feel and sense in our market research. That's wonderful. That's really interesting. And I'd love to delve a little deeper into that shortly. But I think if we could just, I, I think that there's this overwhelming sense of the challenge of the the vision itself, in terms of taking big changes in society, it's how, how do you go about that? So there's this sense of overwhelm that I feel people are feeling in the media that they're consuming and the, the, the sort of negative state of the stories that they're listening to. And something that I always find incredibly beneficial is, is just to take a step back and really recognize there are so many incredible initiatives out there that are making positive change. They are working towards, in all manner of different ways, solutions. And they can demonstrate those solutions and they're putting them into action and they're teaching about them. And I think that it's um, so, so critically important that people have access to, they don't need to understand all the detail, but just this awareness that it is happening, that there are things that can be done. And although those initiatives differ, there's a crossover that, that comes about this kind of regenerative vision in doing things better. So could you maybe offer a few examples of initiatives you've worked with the, to, to, to highlight and inspire us with the range of what's going on out there? 
Yeah, sure. There's a bunch. No, we, we got loads. You can find them all on our website, by the way, for the people listening to this. If you go to uh, guyinet.earth and then you click on projects and you can click the ecosystem overview and you can read images and pictures and the projects I'm going to explain, you'll find there also. So just give a wild, wild, wild um, grab. Um, what an interesting project it's called Threefold. They're working on a decentralized internet. So what are they doing? Instead of having centralized data servers owned by Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they're building a solution where we can all have a little box in our house that connects like a web and forms a self-healing grid where the data storage and the computing power is distributed over that grid. You can compare this to having a coal power plant that provides all the electricity for a city or each person having solar panels and batteries in their house. So they're building that for the internet. And that's going to bring the power completely to the people. And you will have all your, your data at home encrypted and only give access to your data instead of big corporations owning your data. Well, you can imagine what that, that does for power shifting our culture. So that's one. The other one uh, is uh, Holacracy and ENCODE. Uh, Holacracy is a gold standard for self-organization and it distributes authority through a real rule set without leaders or bosses. And then there is another company that was birthed from that. It's called ENCODE. And they've been able to ENCODE the Holacracy rule set into legal forms in nine jurisdictions. That means there is no single owner. The power is distributed. The liability is distributed. It's like a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer organization structure. It's revolutionary. Never existed before. That's also to power shift our cultures post-capitalism. Really beautiful. Then uh, there is a seeds, the regenerative cryptocurrency. They've been going for three years now, and they're working on a coin that um, has no inflation. It's stable and it can be used locally and it's fully transparent. There is no transaction fees on the blockchain for this currency. That's also revolutionary and it's community driven. It's an incredible project also. So they're actually working on a regenerative economical system that is just completely different than what we are used to now with fiat and the banks and the central banks and the governments controlling the money flow and you know again that's a very centralized force that's being broken down and bottom up decentralized and distributed and well we all need money so that's a really important project um and then so these are technology projects right and and legal project that i mentioned but then we have a lot of physical projects in our orbit so we have many people um, building cities and villages of the future where all of these solutions once implemented and integrated such as the internet such as the money such as holacracy in the legal forms will all lead to true community because you can only really have community when you don't have this single leader or single boss or when the money is centralized or the power is centralized so there's people working on creating radical transparency in how to live together, but not in the form of an intentional community or an eco village, no, in the form of a futuristic, innovative, high-tech environment that does not have like the World Economic Forum, you will own nothing and be happy about it. No, we will all own it together and be happy about it. Instead of some, it's, it's again, you know, this from centralization to community owned and driven. Um, so there's one wildly interesting project in Switzerland under development called the Next Generation Village, and it aims to create a, a regulatory sandbox where governments, academia and uh, corporations can try and prototype and test out wildly new solutions for how to guide, steer, build society and civilization. And um, yeah. It, it's super, super advanced and, and interesting, the vision. And this really aims to create some kind of new paradigm living. Um, then we have a lot of smaller projects. For example, what really speaks stands out is uh, the Golden City in Indonesia. They are building a three by one kilometer village of the future with sacred geometry and bamboo and where people get to. Yeah, it's also really Amazing project. We have La Tierra in Costa Rica, a frequency village in the Azores. Um, we have connections everywhere in the world now of people who are really working on this new earth kind of villages and cities. They're very specific because they're all about radical transparency, about uh, uh, listening to the needs, community driven and uh, in harmony with nature. Those are really the main, you know, um, uniting values. And then to close off, because I can speak in... <laughs> 
keep speaking about our project <laughs> for hours, you know, because I'm so excited about them. But the, the one that for me is uh, um, the most exciting is the Aravana project. And uh, the website is aravana.org. People find it quite overwhelming when they go there. So bear with me and really do take your time if this interests you. But um, it's uh, if you're familiar with the Venus project of Jacques Fresco that you've heard about before, this is um, the execution of that, I would say, the design of how can we create a network of cities that work as a resource-based economy that is stateless, moneyless, and coercionless, and that optimizes for global human need fulfillment and ecological restoration. So that's really the goal of this project, to create a network of cities that create a so-called community-type society. And we are currently living in a you know, a capitalist world, we have a, a, a free market that's regulated by the state with a monopoly on violence, and that optimizes for profit. That's the basics of how our societies function now. Those are the core functioning elements of our society. This community type society has no state and no market because there's no trade. And it works like it, it takes a while to really let this into your consciousness of is this actually possible? Because this sounds like an illusion or utopia. Or, but no, it's been specified in a set of standards, so-called socio-technical standards of how to create a community type society. Well, it's, it's been under development for 20 years and uh, it's integrated tremendous amounts of information from a lot of very wise and, and beautiful people on the planet who looked at, you know, what are human needs, uh, like uh, Tony Robbins, uh, Abraham Maslow. Uh, so it goes really deep into the psychology of human needs. It goes really deep into engineering and design, and it goes really deep into what does it mean to be alive as a human being? What are the different stages of life and through which needs do you go in these stages? And then also what it means to live as a community. But again, at a high innovative technological level. So it's a design system. It's a, it's a standard. It's a, it's a standard for creating community. And that has also never existed before. If we manage to implement this, we want to build a prototype here in Alta Paris in Brazil and create a first working model and scale that and grow that. Then over the next one, 200 years, we might be able to transition all of humanity to live as one community on this planet. Well. Yeah, that's, that's phenomenal. It's all incredibly inspiring. Um, you certainly ticked the box on that. And I think I'll, I'll just point out to anybody listening, I will make sure that the links um, to highlight all of the projects you've just discussed are really accessible in the description, because I think that we're all going to need to go and uh, take some time to absorb the different elements of, of what's taken our interest there. But it's, it is... Um, it's awe-inspiring, and the idea that there is so much going on, and it's so hopeful, it's so incredibly in contrast to what we consider to be a mainstream narrative on things. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's difficult to find, to find too much of a summary of that, but I will try. And I think what's come to my mind is that I'd like to consider um, – doing a parallel between what you've discussed there in terms of the societal and economic side of things to the way that regenerative agriculture would, would try to describe itself. It's holistic, it's integrating many complex systems together, but there are principles. So instead of trying to be dictating and prescriptive on, on, on what is encompassed, it instead uses principles. And those principles on this point of view they might be um, transparency and working bottom up instead of uh, power coming top down and um, de decentralizing that power. And, and I suppose we could come up with, um, or I'm sure somebody has come up with a list of principles that, that, that brings and ties this together so people can, to, can recognize that yes, it's, it's very broad, but also there are themes that thread through it. And what is really exciting to me is the idea that there's so much technology being integrated and that, that those solutions that take what we already have and we use every day as society, which is the internet and finance, money, access, and make them a part of the solution as opposed to being something that's a necess necessary evil within our lives. And, 
Um, the idea that we're not looking, you're not describing something that's looking backwards. You're describing something that's taking everything, the future, the technology, and the indigenous wisdom and the old traditional ways, and, and it's bringing it into one. And it's, it, it really does inspire me hugely. And I, I think a lot of people listening also will, will get a really um, uplifted feel and sense of, of what's going on here. So congratulations with, with bringing all of this sort of under one umbrella. It, it's, it's wonderful. Um, have you got any examples of how Guyanet itself has facilitated co-creating um, and, and collaboration and, and some of that, that work that you talked about in helping, helping people to integrate this into organization? Um, I think the most concrete and real thing, we've developed two things. There's a, a Guyanet operating system playbook, as we call it, which describes our way of working, our meeting format, and then very specifically how you can apply that in your own organization. And we have recently run a, quite a large scale experiment where we or, uh, invited 30 organizations to participate in a co-creation experiment. And what we did there was to let them experience the Holacracy tactical meeting. But instead of doing that for an organization and between people, we did that for the whole ecosystem between organizations. So we took it a level higher. And well, I can also share a lot about that. People can watch these videos on our Vimeo channel, vimeo.com slash Guyanet, if they're interested in seeing how that went down, because we record everything, we share everything, we distribute everything, so you can take a look in the kitchen. Um, that is one thing. And the other thing we have been doing, uh, this was, by the way, was extremely well received by the people. Many people had their first experience of distributed authority of like a, a, this kind of a meeting. And the, the, yeah, the response was overwhelmingly the same. Wow, this was the most effective thing I've ever experienced. This was so much fun. I have more energy at the end than at the beginning. I'm not feeling tired. I feel very heard and seen. So it like, it really works to put people together like that. Again, go watch the Vimeo channel to see the video of the meeting and then you will better understand what I mean. And the second thing that we just did is we uh, uh, guided a Belgian team for six months. We were called in to uh, help with, uh, with marketing and the business development, but uh, it was very clear that they needed help with talking, coordinating, coming in resonance, resolving personal issues, and then adopting a structure that allows them to decide the things together, but not in consensus, but using the whole accuracy integrated decision-making process of consent. So Sociocracy also uses this and um, that's very effective. Uh, so when we arrived, I, I could say like there was a lot of tension and a lot of chaos and they would like deal with one agenda item in one and a half hours. It like was extremely slow, the process, and it, it, it was about to fall apart. Like there was so much tension that it was about to fall apart. And now they're thriving. They've got amazing project management. They've got amazing decision processes. They've got uh, the, the people context figured out. The people who were not resonating, they left. Some new people arrived. And I can, I can proudly say that there's an organization now there that has the potential to yeah, you know, last for many years. And the great thing about them is uh, they're working on a holistic healthcare system in the form of a network of health houses in Belgium that is all about taking care of each other together. So holistic, regenerative healthcare that uses the scientific method, but also all kinds of additional techniques to help you get in balance with your mind, emotions and everything. It's a really beautiful project and it's very much in line with our new earth vision. So, um, yeah, and we hope to help many more organizations with that. So, and the, the final thing that we've done for the people is we are recording a series of videos to explain the basics and the principles of self-organization, which can also be found on our Vimeo channel. And um, yeah, that's about it for how we've been that's helping lovely. organizations. Yeah. It's wonderful. So, so in a lot of senses, it, it's, it's the idea that those tensions within an organization that are a barrier to expansion and growth and success they come from the feeling of power coming top down 
and I suppose a sense within the individuals that they're either not being heard or it's not safe to speak and express. And so, so, so much of this is about the, the, the freedom of expression and communication and um, the, the power of, of something so simple as yeah. talking. How has this been for you in your life? And I wonder also the people listening, how has it been for you to, to, to study, to live and to work? And I'm specifically referring to the part, have you felt empowered completely in the spaces where you've been? Have you been able to connect with the people and get things done and feel understood in that? Or have you experienced a lot of implicit, like a having to ask for permission a lot or, uh, you know, like just not moving forward together and having a lot of conflict? It's like, how has your work life been so far? Have you worked for bosses? Have you been self-employed all your life? What, uh, what's been your experience? Yeah, my experience, I have for the most part been self-employed, probably because I, I felt that um, in, in the earlier days of employment, I was not happy. I, was, I did not feel that I was taken, I, I think maybe it, m more a sense of, well, um, your work is not being recognized as, as your value that you're putting, but in, in how can somebody take that and take credit for that? Or, you know, it, it definitely a sense of um, um, sort of just, yeah, you're feeling, feeling dissatisfied. Yeah, I think many have that. Huh? If we look at this dissatisfaction numbers, percentages in the work on the work floor, it's ridiculously high. And I think only 10% of people are really engaged at their work. That's only one in 10 huh? of all organizations. Tiny, so, yeah. and I, 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 I now c come to the, the direct experience that you can all be empowered. You can actually all feel recognized and you can all feel super engaged in the roles that you fulfill. It requires a huge transformation. It's not something you learn from one day to the other, but it's so worth it to learn to work together with a group of people. For this reason, I've also been self-employed all my life. I've had a couple of jobs, but just like did not make me feel shining. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of the biggest oversights in terms of we, we, we look at all the different um, ways that an organization can achieve greater profits and can squeeze out that efficiency, but we overlook the power of passion within the individuals that are working there and how much they bring to the table when they're engaged, when they're enthusiastic versus when they're dragging themselves through the day. And I suppose that is, is, is what the power is with, with what you're doing. Yeah, and I don't get that because we have so much science, we have so much literature, we have so much data nowadays that shows that when people experience meaning, when they are engaged with what they are doing, they're much more effective, much more productive than when they're not. So, so it's funny, it's not about an understanding anymore in the collective. It is still about programs and trauma and yeah it's it's again what i started my sharing with with the people that are really willing to grow and change and transform themselves and the majority of people are still too comfortable with the way that things are and rather not have too many responsibilities and the only way to work in a self-organizing form and to really empower yourself is if you are willing to take on the responsibility fully for your actions in your work yeah, yeah. it's a shift but we're getting there. Yeah, there's, there's, there's steps that need to be taken rather than one massive leap, sort of each individual finding their own comfort level within that. Um, but I think if we really zoom out on this, if we have this ability to transform, as you've described, within a company that feels just very tense and um, like it's really struggling, to, to looking towards this um, self-organisation and this different way of, moving forward with things they are now thriving and if we then take that instead of looking just one organization we say well there are so many wonderful incredible efforts going on around the globe um can we fast forward beyond what would seem to be possible um, we have this place where we're at now where things feel very very negative on the whole um, sort of like that, that broader picture and the sort of disasters that we see in, in so many different aspects of life. And then we have this vision, as you've described, a very beautiful, very thriving world of people 
living vital lives where they're passionate and they're happy. Um, they seem worlds apart, but could self-organisation be a accelerator within that? Because there's so much that's already existing and it's a case of, I think you described it perfectly earlier on, the mycelium. The mycelium is missing within the soil, but maybe it's missing in society too. And so what role does self-organisation have in, in that, 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 um, that transition? I think it's the easiest way to practice transparency. For people to learn to be more transparent towards themselves, towards others, about what they're doing and about what they're feeling. This is really beautifully defined in the Aravana project that if we are to create 100% trust in our societies, which I think we need to get there, we need to be able to trust everything and everybody again. The only way to get that is with 100% transparency. A big problem why we have so many challenges is because there's so much obscure and hidden and and done behind closed doors and stuff that involve and affect the collective. In my opinion, nothing that really directs or controls our societies should be obscure. We should all have the right to see what's going on behind closed doors. Now, this is ob obviously another big rabbit hole because you can think about like, what if there's threats and dangers and the larger people? There's many reasons why things are hidden also. Um, but at the small scale, and, and to answer your question, yes, I believe that self-organization can be a massive accelerator for power shifting humanity's yeah, mindset of how we deal with each other. And also how we interact with nature, because there is still this program that we are dominating nature and that we are the ones that, but look at what's happening. Our ecosystems are collapsing. We are definitely not heading for a right direction. And many people are worried about this. And the, the youngest generation now, I think like what, it's like 50 or 60% or something is really upset and concerned about their future because they're directly affected by all these changes. And so something really needs to change. And I do believe that self-organization can help the individual to start thriving more from the inside out and therefore become more of service also to the greater whole. Yeah. Yeah, I think transparency is a very beautiful way of looking at it because without transparency, there isn't trust. And if there isn't trust, there's a great sense of, I suppose, almost without even realizing it, that the lack of safety, you don't feel so safe if you don't trust in the information or in the support that's around you. And so, so clearly these are very, very key and very powerful things that just are completely dismissed and overlooked from the way we do things. So it really is a, you know, tipping thing is right round and up on their head. Yeah. Um, yeah, the and in, very, in a, very extreme now. I don't know what to trust anymore. Like which news yes, of which side, to be very honest, when this, this pandemic came out, the World Health Organization was giving recommendations. And at that time, I never really looked into that. And I accepted all of that. And the CDC and all these institutes, these renowned institutes know that have been developing for decades. I trusted in them fully. I thought, oh, the information that's coming from there, it's the World Health Organization, man. That's a beautiful organization, right? But going deeper the last two years, and I'd already done a lot of digging and, and reading into big corporations and how the money works and where is the influence and where is the corruption. But it's, it's horrible. Like there's almost no renowned global institute anymore that I can trust. And that's very hard because what is left then, you know? So we need to rekindle that kind of trust between each other and create transparent organizations that can gain the trust of our, yeah, of the people. Within. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a scary thing for people to, um, I suppose there's there's a security in having an authority that you can trust, but then you are placing your power with that authority, and if you blindly listen, then that that's when things can become. Um, detrimental to the whole and like you say if we can learn to from the bottom upwards have transparency then that's going to go an, a, a very long way to the feeling of security stability and um, those are essential kind of motions to work through to get from 
feeling very, very heavy to, to feeling like kind of lighter and more enthusiastic about life itself. So, um, and I would, I would like to turn um, the conversation just for a, a short while onto the topic of money, because I think that it's, in my observation, it's one of the biggest sticking points to change. And I think obviously it's, it's such a big topic. It's such a, icky topic to a lot of people it's like oh you know I'm not I don't feel comfortable talking about money or they feel very stressed at the thought of money but a lot of the time it's not just about not having access to money but there is a mindset towards it that that can can be a barrier um particularly for the sort of projects that you're sort of you're talking about redistributing power and balancing things out and and Within that, if you hold this view that money equals bad because money equals greed and money equals unequal power, then you can kind of reject money oh, itself, yeah. even, if, even if it's not in a deliberate way. So do you feel like we can simply, not simply, it's never simple, but, but that if we considered money from a new point of view, so for example, we just say this is a beautiful exchange of value between one another for um, something that has been offered, and then there's, there's the return on that. And, and we look at money without all of those kind of old, heavy um, ideas. Is that enough to move things in the new direction, or do we need to really reconsider money um, overall? Because it's such an incredibly huge part of the, 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 the picture. It's a very big question. And also, it is a big question. <laughs> I can also talk about this for a long time. Let me try to. So, look, we live in a world now where there's money. It's very simple. And we live in a world right now that in order to get your needs met, you need to be able to meet other people's needs as an individual. Whether you do that through a job or an entrepreneur, you need to uh, uh, somehow contribute to creating products and services that are valued in the market. That's just the way it is. So, you just. Yeah, we all need to make money at some point. Um, there's nothing wrong with money. Money is its just a tool. There's nothing wrong with a hammer. There's something wrong with a hammer when somebody picks it up and hurts somebody else with that hammer. And that's the same with money. And there's many people hurting many people with money. They are wrongly, they're abusing the tool. And again, it's super centralized. Now you can go, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but... There is, a, 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 besides the, the logical, the intellectual, and the physical aspect of money, there is an energetic aspect to money. And there is, the, it's very dark. What's behind the centralized money controlled on this planet is very, very dark. There's people with very bad intentions and who have become so addicted to power that they don't mind killing millions of people to gain more money. And we are all, whether we like it or not, affected by that energetic field, whether we are conscious of it or not. So in that sense, the world of money is really disturbing and really dark. But it's more about the monetary system. It's not about the aspect of using a coin as a tool to exchange value with each other. Therefore, cryptocurrencies or local monies or something like seeds can be really beautiful transition tools. So we need to create a different form of how to interact with money that still has trade and that still works on translating goods and services to a number. Okay, because that's what we do with money, right? We translate needs to a number and we trade, translate goods and services to a number so that these can interact. That the need can be met through a product or service with the form of this tool of money. And that's inevitable at this moment. So we're not going to get away from that probably in the next one, two, three generations. So we need to build tools and they're under development. I just mentioned one and there's actually many tools under development that are looking to transform our economical system from the centralized power structures of the central bank and the government with fiat and, you know, they control all the money flows and inflation and the economy and the market towards like cryptocurrencies or other solutions like seeds or well, there's many things under development, but the ultimate solution or the ultimate goal is to transcend the money paradigm. 
And many people are like, whoa, man, what, what a moneyless society is impossible. And they come up with lots of arguments. It's just because it's too far away from their current reality that they can't even like contemplate on it. But I truly believe, and also it's very well specified and explained in Aravena, how we can create a society that operates without the exchange of anything with no more trade. That means with no more money. But again, I, that's like so far into the future. I'm not going to go into that explanation for now. I hope I've answered the question as good as Yes, possible. yes, you have. It's an, it's it's a very interesting, like you say, it's a broad topic and it's just really interesting to hear um, your thoughts on it. And I think also your awareness and ability to, to see that there's so many developments going on within that space. Um, so, so it, it's something that it's, it's good to know that there's a lot of minds obviously going into these puzzles and uh, coming up with variations. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. But yeah, I have a very big dream and a very big vision and I have no problem receiving insane amounts of money to realize that vision. I'm also not overwhelmed by the idea of many zeros on a bank account. It's like, great, man. That means impact. That means realization of a goal, of a purpose that's going to help the future generations forward. So I'm looking at money like that, that I'm open to receive millions, even billions of dollars to, to build networks of cities. It's like nothing weird for me about that. For many people are, as soon as there's five zeros behind something, they're already starting to get weirded out by it. So that's a sign, though, to look at your relationship with energy. In the end, it's the access to energy. And I think um, also that's a really deep, let's not go into that one, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that you've summarized it really lovely yeah. there. It's, it's a sense of um, connecting the money with the very heart-centered ambition and vision, as opposed to, as you said, this very heavy, this very dark idea that there's an addiction to power and that money is, um, it, it just, it, it's no longer actually providing happiness for a person, but it's prepared through that need to obtain that money or to keep hold of that money to actually cause detriment to other people around them and yeah. that that's two incredible extremes and so so money itself as you've said it's just the, the hammer and what are you going to do with it that's really beautiful summary um yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So it has been a huge, huge pleasure to, to speak with you and to learn about all of these wonderful projects and ideas. And the vision itself is um, phenomenal. And I have no doubt that there's, there's just going to be more and more people that you're finding on this journey that are going to tie in and um, offer, offer a piece of the puzzle. And so it would be fantastic uh, before we close to just hear What's next for Guyanet? Is, is, is there a particular focus that you've got right now, a project that you, you're talking about in Brazil? Is that connected to Guyanet? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there's, there's plenty going on. Plenty going on. Yeah. Um, so at this moment, our main focus point. So uh, let's uh, start with the purpose of Guyanet before I talk about the focus. Uh, the purpose we redefined, or, well, we just properly put it down this year is to unite all of the stakeholders of the new earth into a regenerative network and facilitating the implementation of a community type society that means finding the true truths finding the projects and bringing the people to the projects and connecting the projects together so what are we doing in the next period we're focusing on uh, consulting leads to help them with our support services. We're focused on recruitment and building the capacity of Guyanet, thereby also educating and training people. So if you're very interested in uh, learning how to self-organize, we have like an apprenticeship now where you can join the organization for three months, six months and get really good at this and then also potentially become a Guyanet consultant. So once you've earned your badge that you've acquired, you know, the, the necessary skills to start helping other people, then also that can help happen through the network. And um, yeah, we're going to keep working on the ecosystem mapping project, which intends to create tools, matchmaking tools for people in the network to better find each other and to fulfill each other's needs. So that will be about what have I got to offer and what is it that I need and then create digital tooling technology that is under development right now, like a Tinder application that matches you with other people relevant to your project. 
We are going to continue to develop our support services in video material and training material. And finally, we're going to launch the first version of this uh, experiment that I told you about, this uh, multi-organization cross-collaboration tool that we are developing. And uh, that's going to be a, also to tie into money and business model. That's going to be a paid service. So Guynet's free for all the members. There's no cost. There's no membership fee to be on the platform or to attend the calls, the meetings. All of our work is open source. So we give a lot to the world for free. And like you say, we need a niche. We need to see where is the value. We need to see where is the need in the market and then monetize on that. And nothing wrong with that. We're just like, you know, bringing a big gift and it's okay to receive a reward for that. So... That's where we are working on our development in the next months. That's wonderful. It sounds um, incredibly busy for you, but very exciting. And it's it's fantastic to hear that you, you're taking such an effort to bring all these different um, initiatives and organizations and projects and give them a home where they can find connectivity between them. And yeah, that, that that's very, very exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, I suppose we've summed it up already that there is information on the website itself and anybody looking to, to get involved or learn more will find all of that on GaiaNet.com. Yes, indeed. They can, uh, if they want to get in contact, uh, use the contact form on the website. And I'm also comfortable they can reach me on my Telegram channel if anybody wants to send a direct message. My Telegram handle is at Dan Telegram. It's Dan with double A. Uh, yeah, that should be enough for people to reach us. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us and very best of luck with everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. We have a, we have a saying that's going around in the whole ecosystem, which is uh, we are the ones we have been waiting for. And the people who feel that in their heart and in their body, they know what I mean. Because it's not going to happen top down. The politicians, our current world leaders, they're not going to save us. And we've seen that for, well, since the first climate control, the climate report came out. We've been talking about this for 50 years. There's no fundamental systemic change happening. Of course, a lot's happening. But we are really the ones we've been waiting for. So um, it's beautiful to find more and more people who resonate with that and who want to unite and want, who, who want to create this, uh, yeah, this new earth. Fantastic. It's a very powerful statement. Wonderful. And thank you for listening to this episode of We Are Carbon. Next time we'll be joined by Charlotte Prudhomme to gain an understanding of permaculture. She'll share her knowledge and experience from across a number of projects to consider what permaculture means at large, and also take us through a deep dive of her work at Walker's Reserve in Barbados, which is an extensive project of research, restoration and community building at a former sand quarry. New episodes will now be added every other Tuesday, so don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date. And remember to check out the description if you'd like to assist with some guidance on my new initiative for shouting loudly about the power in our food choices. So let's keep figuring this all out together. <laughs>